the member for Wentworth. I ask leave of the House to move amendments 1 and 2 as circulated in my name together. Here's leave granted. I call the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Right. Leave is granted. I give the call to the member for Wentworth. Thank you, um, Speaker, and thank you also to the Minister for the very constructive conversation um, and that we have had over a number of weeks and months around the, um, around the safeguard mechanism and the reports that we have had in terms of the stronger amendments that are likely to be passed in the other place. However, if we want strong action on climate change, getting the safeguard mechanism reforms right is imperative, and my job is to ensure that those changes that are necessary to the, to the legislation are put forward. This scheme covers only 215 facilities in a country of nearly 26 million people, but combined these polluters account for nearly a third of our carbon emissions, and around 40 per cent of this comes from just 12 fossil fuel companies. These facilities have been told they must do a proportional share of national emissions reduction task. That is only fair. Our biggest polluters must pull their weight in helping us achieve a 43 per cent reduction in emissions by 2030. But the path to even this modest target is a narrow one. Modelling released by Reputex earlier this month showed that even relatively small changes in the production of fossil fuels could blow out the proposed emissions budget for the safeguard. If the government's estimates of emissions from just 16 well-advanced new coal and gas projects are even slightly out, we could see the budget blown by 35 million tonnes. That's equivalent to the annual emissions of 1.6 million Australians. We cannot take this risk, and so we need a legislative guardrail. That's why I'm moving this amendment number one to legislate the emissions budget at a maximum of 1,233 million tonnes over the next decade of net emissions. This will lock in at least 205 million tonnes of abatement in line with the government's target. My amendment will provide legislative certainty of our decarbonisation path in the very same way that this House provided legislative certainty for our 2030 and 2050 targets when we passed the climate change bill. It is consistent with the intention of the scheme, it is consistent with government's policy, and it is consistent with stronger action on climate. So I urge the government to accept this amendment. My second amendment um, also covers the government's current decision to allow safeguard facilities to have unlimited access to offsets and to cap the price of these offsets at $75 in the first year. Nobody is saying that offsets do not have a role to play in climate policy, but the science is clear. They are no substitute for genuine emissions reduction. So they must be used at least as a last resort to accommodate the small number of sectors where it's particularly hard to reduce emissions in the short term. As the price of offsets must reflect the true cost of carbon, not some discounted rate that has been agreed with the mining lobby. The government's $75 price cap is well below the carbon price in Europe, which is currently around $150. It is well below estimates of the carbon price needed for a 1.5 degree world, which exceed $150. It is even below the carbon price that the New South Wales Treasury recommends is used for evaluating the costs and benefits of different projects in my home state. By capping the price at $75, the government may have significantly weakened incentives for decarbonisation, when instead we need to encourage businesses to invest in the technologies of the future. And they may have also created a future liability for the taxpayer, who will need to subsidise safeguard facilities' purchases of offsets if the market price in future exceeds the government cap. I understand that both major parties have been resistant to putting a price on carbon, and this has been the key reason for a decade of climate policy failure. And the government has raised with me several justifications for a price cap, including the need to provide certainty to business and to ensure that ACU markets are not subject to speculation. But on closer inspection, these explanations don't stack up. Over the past few months, I have spoken from people from across the business and investor community many of whom have internal carbon prices in place and all of whom have access to projections of its future trajectory. And I've also spoken with many participants in the carbon market, none of whom have raised major concerns about speculation. The real risk is not speculation. It's that this price cap slows the pace of carbon emission reduction, and so we need to see change. My amendment removes the price caps on offsets and so that the true cost of carbon is reflected in investment decision making and so our biggest emitters can't just continue to pollute on the cheap. We can't offset our way out of this climate crisis and so I urge the government to adopt this amendment. 
And finally, I'd like to wrap up by thanking the government for its very constructive engagement um, on this. I hope very much that the reports of what will be passed in the other place are accurate in terms of where the safeguard mechanism is going to go, because this is absolutely critical legislation, and we have to get it right to both reduce emissions but ensure those, those, uh, uh, those facilities that are not coal and gas who can't reduce their emissions in the same way are protected to be able to build their businesses for the future. I'll just ask